<laughs> I'm so scared. I'm Don't scared. be scared. We are live here on Keystroke Medium. Welcome to this uh, Monday evening to the show. It is season three, episode 55. Uh, I am Josh Hayes here with Chuck Moon and or Chuck Moon. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I have not Chuck. drank any of this bourbon yet. Scott Moon, uh, Scott, Chuck Manley and uh, Scott Moon. Or uh, Scott Manley and Chuck Moon. Josh We're just going to do that from Josh, now on. Josh Manley. Just say Moon and Manley. For, just, Chuck, uh, oh, a Manly Moon. We're here with Manly Moon, moon today um, Josh, with Drayton, Chaney, and uh, Jonathan Yanez. Jonathan Yanez has been on the show twice, I think. I think, twice. I think once. Just one time. Huh? Yeah, unless I'm like blacking out. Yeah. Something like that, and I was blacking it out of my memory. But I think it just once. <laughs> Most well, people you do. On the show with your KSM shirt, your orange KSM. Was that the only time you've ever been on? Yeah, that was like the red KSM shirt. Yeah, like, that was like round one of KSM shirts. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it was actually. It was uh, the first version. That's crazy. For some reason, I thought you've been on longer, uh, more times than that. That's a big impression on Josh. Uh, well, welcome. <laughs> back. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, welcome back, Jonathan and uh, Jeff. Uh, welcome, welcome to the show. Uh, it's great to yeah. have you guys with us. Yeah, this is the first time here, so. Pretty garbly, Josh. Me? Yeah. I can hear you. Maybe. Yeah, do you that. sound like you got a mouthful of marbles to me. Maybe it's my end. I don't know. Oh, uh, it's a mouthful for a bourbon. Does that make any difference? It's probably the facial. It will in about 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Um, do you and Chuck have the same facial hair? Real quick. I just wanted to clear that up. I don't know. Yeah. Do we? It's like the Tony Stark. It's the Tony Stark. Yeah, look. it's the Van Dyke. I have, I've go. had this Van Dyke for uh, 24 years, I think. Something like that. Josh, nice. it's for 24 days. Yeah. I, I, I remember. I've got to lose mine in like five days. But I think yeah, before. I he's going to bring up or something. Is, Josh from the evil Star Trek universe. Yeah. Yeah. Like the uh the crossover series. Except I'm gonna do like a Fu Manchu for this last week. I'm gonna go. the middle here. Just like yeah, shave yeah. just the chin part of the circle. Yeah, it's like my supervisor at work, not Scott, but another one. He's got the soul patch and he's had the soul yeah. patch for 20 years, completely out of regs for 20 years, and nobody has ever said anything to him. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the KSM facial hair episode, folks. <laughs> <laughs> um we're going to talk about some collaboration uh tonight on the show which is kind of a been a trend here for the last couple of episodes and um obviously with with scott and i working with richard and um uh nick cole and jason onsbach in the galaxy's edge series and uh working together on some short stories collaboration is I, a big deal for us here on the show and i think going forward we talked about last week collaboration being a huge thing in 2019 and uh uh i mean it's 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 big in 2018 already but i think going into 2019 it's going to be something uh something bigger and and something maybe we haven't even seen well, to ask about it um jonathan you've done a couple you've done one with now uh, jn and you've done one with uh justin sloan um so maybe we can get into the kind of the differences that that happen with those two partnerships but uh uh, Jeff, can I call you Jeff on the show? Or can we? Well, oh, since yeah. I have. Yeah. Um, Jeff, we haven't had you on the show, so if you would, just kind of introduce yourself and then uh, tell us how you got started in writing. Um, well, I uh, have been writing professionally now for, I think, almost five years since um, I got out of the Air Force back in 2008. 14 like yeah so about four and a half years now um before that i was in school for it i got my master's in creative writing while i was in the air force before that the bachelor's and i've been writing just as you know a hobby since i was probably 15. um and i didn't get into sci-fi as far as like books i was playing video games long before that but as far as books go uh until i read ender's game when i was like 17. um great book yeah, amazing book. Um, huge influence on me, but books weren't really like, at least sci-fi books, you know, that those kinds of stories weren't really, um, I wasn't exposed to that stuff as a kid, so I kind of caught the bug later. And uh, man, when I did, it was like, I got totally infected and just couldn't stop. So 
that's when that's the book that made me want to be a writer and uh just haven't stopped since then and that's that was like i don't know 15 16 years ago something like that and your, your current series uh renegade renegade star there's uh i think six books in the the, the renegade star proper series and then obviously eight there's eight books okay uh and then you you've got your your collaboration with jonathan uh, tell us a little bit about that series, and um, I, I just actually finished the the two book publishers pack tonight of the uh, the Renegade Star audiobook read by the one and only Luke Daniels. So it's a fantastic listen. Um, kind of reminds me of uh, uh, Firefly, kind of in a sense, but more of like an Andromeda almost. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, tell us about that series. Kind of what what went into that, and and how you went about creating it. Uh, well, Renegade Star was an idea that started from a video game. Everyone sees Firefly in it, uh, but the inspiration really uh, came from a game that I was playing at the time called Persona 5, which is an RPG um, set in modern Japan. And uh, there's a shop owner in that game who has a son, and the son had a scar on his neck and so, like, the dad adopted this kid. He was in the Yakuza, and he gets out of the Yakuza, adopts this kid, and raises him as his own son. And so, over the scar, which I think was, like, cigarette uh, burns or something like that, uh, he puts a salamander tattoo. And uh, that's sort of, like, the symbol of their family. And um, their, their, you know, father-son adopted family. And so, I really like the idea of this, you know, like, this grown man who was a criminal like getting out of that lifestyle to adopt this kid and uh you know i like the implementation of the tattoo and everything like that so i started to uh think about that you know and i was talking to um, a friend of mine at the time and we were going over just different stories and you know different sci-fi ideas and stuff like that and while we were on vacation and um i was telling her about that story from this game. And as I kept talking about it, I was taught, I started talking about this um, story I was developing, which is the beginning of Renegade Star, where he's in his ship talking to an AI, talking to Sigmund. And then I thought, oh, what if I blended these together and I created like, you know, and that's, it kind of went from there. And so the tattoo kind of took its own, you know, it's it's like almost like Water World, where it sort of like helps them find Earth and it acts mm. as a key and um, not really a map, but a way to get a map. Uh, and then Jace sort of took on. I mean, he was always supposed to be like a space western, but it sort of he sort of took on this like Harrison Ford persona, um, like Han Solo or Malcolm Reynolds from Firefly, and you know, so it depending on the reader, they see similarities from multiple different things. I mean, I've got people equating this to Isaac Asimov stories. I got people equating this to uh, Firefly and, um, you know, Battlestar Galactica. And it's interesting. It's just funny because like none of those really contributed to this. It came from, <laughs> it came from uh, you know, a video game that I played like, you know, two years ago. It's just, readers always kind of bring their own framework, you know, and how they, they're, they, they have their own background and, bring on things to the story which i think is interesting how people see every story a little differently yeah i mean it works for me because people people like what they're what's familiar they like what they like and um i guess you know they saw something in the series that struck a chord and um it's really taken off and that's why i was able to bring jonathan on as a co-writer because there's so much uh in the universe that we can explore and there still is there's like so many stories that i could get into um and that's why like i wrote a, a prequel spinoff about abigail who's like the main uh the main uh female character in the in the books uh that jace meets at the beginning uh she's dressed like a nun and she's a, a trained assassin um you know and and people really like that and people are really enjoying orion colony which is our story and that's set two thousand years before renegade star so oh that's interesting yeah like what like way way before totally different part of the galaxy so they're very loosely connected but it really fills out the lore of the universe and the history that gets alluded to as you go through renegade star and you right you get like archaeological, you know, historic tidbits 
um, of information. And then when you read Orion Colony, a lot of it gets really fleshed out and you really get a better picture of what happened to Earth. Um, oh, that's very cool. Yeah. And like the, uh, like the technology at its prime, you know, not 2,000 years later when it's barely functional. So, so I'm interested uh, and um, I want to touch kind of on the, the cool way that you touched on Earth and the lore in the series and, and, and kind of like you mentioned Battlestar Galactica where um, there's a whole kind of not quite a religion based on, I mean, there kind of is, but not, not, it's not a religion per se, but it's kind of, kind of like uh, a, a prophesized, this is something from the past that people know about, but it's, it's mythical. It's not even like a real thing. It's like for us, it's like, um, like Atlantis, right? Like it, it could have been there, but it, it might not have been, there's no real way. There's not a tangible way to touch it. Um, and I think that's really cool how you presented that concept in the book and then how you kind of littered on these different planets, um, these, these, different ruins and different kind of events that happen to, to push the the crew into a certain direction. Yeah. So I've always really been into like Atlantis stories and, you know, um, all these angel, like Pan the lost city of Patagonia, right? Like cities that cities and cultures and, and uh, you know, myths that are, that people used to think were real. Like um, was it uh, they thought there was, I can't remember who it was. Um, one of the philosophers had like said that there was a tribe of people like uh, headhunters and um, uh, man eaters, like right off the coast of Greece at one point. And it turned out to be not true, but he was one of the first historians. Um, mm. um, I can't, it's, it starts with an H I think, but uh, I've always been really into that stuff. And I was a, I was a humanities minor in college when I was getting my creative writing degree. Uh, so I read tons of myths and, uh, you know, got really into the history of it all. Um, and so when I, when, yeah, exactly. And so when I, when I write these stories, um, I always end up kind of fusing in archeology span and anthropology into this stuff. When I wrote my first series, I did that too. Like it takes place in the future and it's a dystopian series. Uh, and it's hundreds of years after, uh, you know, the surface of the earth has been wiped out, but like the buildings are still there and some of the technology. And so like, they're always excavating things, you know, in, uh, in the society and like trying to remember what happened and figure, you know, solve these mysteries. And so I've always had a fondness for like sci-fi archeology. span And I think a lot of it stems from that, but yeah, making earth a myth just, um, seems like the, the most fun uh, way of going about it instead of just saying like, yes, this existed or making a religion out of it or anything like that, but really making it more like a storybook that kids will read or like grandmothers will read to their kid, you know, their grandkids or something like that. And if you read nameless, which is the, the prequel about Abigail, uh, she actually, it starts when she's a kid and goes all the way up until her late teen years, early twenties. And she, the whole time she has this book, and it's about Earth. There are myths from Earth. And she just reads that, uh, you know, as like a child's storybook, and it's her favorite book. But some of it is actually real, and she just doesn't know that. But that's what kind right. of gets her into pursuing this, you know, whole Earth thing later on in life after we meet her in Renegade Star. So I'm curious, uh, Jonathan, about... Um how you came into this anthology and Jonathan, you've written um, several collaborations. Like we mentioned before, one, one with uh, Justin Sloan and then the, uh, the order of the Centurion books, which um, not really a collaboration per se, more like a franchise author uh, in that series. Um, maybe for those who haven't uh, met Jonathan yet, maybe give us a little bit of lowdown on who you are and, and how you got started and all this crazy nonsense. And you start yeah. with you have a full beard, not just a goatee. That was <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, Every once in a while, that. I just let it go to see how far I can let it get out. But then once my food <laughs> starts getting stuck on it or I have to do like an interview or something like that, I'm like, okay, it's probably about time to like tighten up a little bit. Oh, you save it for seconds. Like, oh, that's, nice. <laughs> that's not frowned upon. In my house, that's frowned upon. <laughs> no, not at all. You're good. <laughs> Let's see. So I've been writing almost, as, I think, 
Um, for like five to six years now, six years now I've been writing and I've done a bunch of different collaborations with, uh, Justin Sloan with uh, galaxy's edge. Like I said, order the centurion, April Baker, and then my wife who goes by the pen name JR castle. We did gateway to the galaxy. So it's been fun collaborating with authors and it was. it's, uh, it's cool collaborating with them because I write fast enough where I'm also able to write my own stuff on the side. So whoever I'm writing with, I'm also able to get um, books out and series that I'm working on, like the Archangel Wars, or uh, like with Jen and I working with Jeff. I'd write a book for Jeff, and then I finish the last Gateway to the Galaxy book, and then tomorrow I'll finish the second Orion book. Um, and that's cool because I can write almost two books a month if I'm like really cranking and the caffeine's running freely. So. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it's been cool working with everybody. I think collaborations is really fun, especially when I'm talking with Jeff about like the storyline, because I don't really think like he's probably more the voice of reason than I am. Sure. But usually, I don't really know if there's a voice of reason. Do you think so, Jeff? Usually, like I come up with a crazy idea, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah," and how about this? And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah," and how about this? And it just keeps mm -hmm. on going down the rabbit hole. Yeah, I think if you if you get a collaborator. Uh, that thinks like you do and who has like a similar background um, as far as like, you know, what they grew up with, what they grew up reading um, and the style that you're going for um, that can really help. And I think that, you know, Jonathan and I, we share a lot of like common interests with our sci-fi, uh, which really helps. So I don't know, different people have different methods and um, you have to, be flexible as well with your ideas. So like it's my universe and everything, you know, with Renegade Star, but at the same time, like I want Jonathan to bring his own ideas and his unique voice to that. Um, otherwise it's, it's no fun for either of us because then it's like, he's turning out the words and I'm just like taking over and like, you know, completely changing everything. And that's just like, I don't know, that's not fun. You know, right. Well, that's the, the big thing when it comes to collaboration is both authors need to feel like uh, a but well, number one, they both have to have a good time with it. Um, if you're if you're if neither party is is uh, feeling it, then it's not going to be a good collaboration. Um, but two, I think both authors need to feel like they're contributing to the overall process. Um, so we'll get to that here in a little while. But one of my question was um, when you guys first started talking about this or, or, or Jeff, when you first started kind of reaching out for a co-author to expand your series, what, what was it exactly that you were looking for? Were you looking specifically to, 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 to kind of uh, draw out or, or illustrate the lore more, or were you just looking for some more um, content in your universe and, and to pull more readers in? What, what, what brought you guys together? Um, well, Jonathan and I, we've been friends for a little while now, and uh, we were talking about doing something together at some point, and then I had this idea, for this very specific idea and time period, and I, w I realized that I, I could branch that leg out, you know, um, in, the, in the timeline, in the story, uh, but I didn't have the time to write it. Mm -hmm. So I started talking to Jonathan about it and he really liked the idea. Uh, and then we sort of like fleshed it out from there and came up with a Ryan colony. Jeff's um, just being nice right now. He's saving me some face because I was just stalking him until he said, all right, fine. If you leave me alone, you can write in my universe. <laughs> no, I will say though that I do think Jeff is the voice of reason because I was thinking of something right now. You and I talked about Jeff in the book and you know what I'm talking about. But you're like, no, dude, that's too dark. And I'm like, oh, I'm just going to do it. Let me just do it anyway. And then you can see how, like, read it and tell me what you feel like. So I think Jeff is probably slightly the voice of reason in our co-authorship. You know, what's interesting to me is that especially with working, like, with Richard for so long, I know, I know what Richard's going to hate before I put it in the book. And sometimes I do it on purpose. <laughs> I'm like, absolutely going to hate this idea. And he's going to hate this whole scene. But I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> you know, I'll write like 2,000 words of a scene. I absolutely know he's he, he's just going to read it, and I know exactly what it's going to say. He's going to have one comment at the end of the scene. And, Scott, you know what it's going to be, and it's it's all, it's all one word, no. And that's <laughs> like I know exactly. That's how it's going to He's going to read the whole thing. He's like, nope. 
and then move on. <laughs> um, so, I uh, I had lunch with him like last week because we you know because I just moved to Vegas and he lives like right down the road for me. Nice. Yeah. So next time we go, I'm gonna drill him about questions about your collaboration. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know it's it's uh it's going well. Uh, I just turned in the third book and uh, we're actually talking about the fourth book right now uh, to start planning it. Um, which kind of goes along the, the lines of process. So, you know, there's, we've talked a, a couple of episodes about collaboration and different ways to do it. And whether you're, you're outlining and Jonathan's writing or you outline together, or you write together, there's so many different ways to collaborate. And uh, so I kind of want to delve deep into how you guys do it and, and, you know, how, how, how long did it take you to to kind of hit your stride and figure out this is the best way for us and and what is that? Yeah, I mean, we just started uh, talking about ideas first, and we've had like tons of phone calls, and I think that's how we work best. It's just over the phone, mm. um, just like spitballing ideas and going over the book as it comes to us, um, and then after the initial idea phase of it, like we have the basic beats outlined like over the phone, I pretty much hand it off to Jonathan and I say like, okay, uh, roll with this and see what you can come up with. Um, and then once he, once he's got the book done and ready to, well, okay, along the way, he'll call me multiple times and we'll have even, you know, additional conversations about the details and the finer points and stuff and the character development and different ideas. Uh, he'll ask questions about the universe and the world and the lore and everything. So it's an ongoing process. Um, initially we made like a massive document with tons and tons of notes. Um, and you know, that's all great when you're starting out, but once I think both authors have a firm grasp on the story and the characters and everything like that, it's a lot easier to just keep it going. And so we just do that over the phone. Once he's done with the book, he sends it to me and then I go through it and like fill in anything that I think could like feed, you know, help the story or like uh, fill out the world or the lore, anything like that. Make sure that there, you know, nothing contradicts like other stuff in the other books uh, or anything that I'm currently working on myself. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it, but you know, he can, he can elaborate more on that. Yeah. Jeff saved me a lot. Like one of the big points in Orion colony is I had our ships, our seed ships, taking off from earth and like i thought that's the way we were going to roll with it but earlier in his universe he had explained that they actually take off from is it around mars jeff yeah there's like uh there's ship factories you know that are run by this ai called hephaestus um or is that well he's not an ai but he's like a, a sentient ai and he's in the books later on he's gone crazy and um so oh, hephaestus, crazy ai yeah well, Hephaestus, he, uh, he's in charge of the ship production, uh, the, well, the, the uh, defense network. And in conjunction with that, you have the ship factories where all these things are built. And so the drone factory. And so these ships, these seat ships are built um, in conjunction with these factories and um, in factories on Earth where the transients, uh, and that's where our book starts, where they work. And one of our... Like our main character, Dean, is um, an engineer in one of these factories. So he's building the ship that he's going to travel on. Yeah. But yeah, originally we had it taking off like right near the factory. And so when I got into there, you know, I got into the book and everything and tweaked things around a bit uh, just to match the lore from the other books that it takes off in space. So they had to take a shuttle to this um, to the seed ship. Yeah, and what's cool about our partnership too is that Jeff kind of lets me do what I do best and that's just like grind it out and just like have freedom because that's where it's fun with me when I'm writing is if I don't I don't outline at all. So Jeff and I talk about something and then that's it. Like I'm not writing anything down. I just have it in my head, okay, like X, Y, and Z is going to happen and then I just flow with it. So it's been cool him allowing me kind of have freedom within his world to go ahead and develop some characters and like who Dean really is. And we're both really into uh, comics. So we're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna make him like this, or I'm gonna make this person like that. And we know exactly what each other's talking about. Yeah, and the, the phone calls along the way too, like it's not just an initial talk and then the book, you know, it's like we have incremental like, you know, catch ups and everything. And 
like there's been times where he's run an idea that he just wrote about by me and I'm like, oh, we can't do that, you know, and so he'll have to backpedal and fix it and then we'll keep going. Uh, <laughs> which I feel bad about because it's like, you know, now you get to rewrite right. that, but you know, it hasn't been it hasn't been like bad or anything. Uh, I think it's like maybe one or two instances where it was just like a quick fix. Uh, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, it's been pretty smooth. And, um, you know, we've got the same cover artist that does the Renegade stuff um, doing that. So it's the same, you know, kind of feel to it. And uh, we've got the same editors. We've got uh, Jonathan's got like a team of um, beta readers now that we're using. So, you know, it's important to have like that team that support system in place, too, when you're doing this. People that are already familiar with the universe who can catch, uh, you know, um, any kind of issues that pop up for continuity purposes. And uh, yeah, I mean, so that's what, that's what I've been working on is like sort of this, this backbone for the system because I do plan on bringing in like a few more collaborators over 2019. And uh, this is really like, we're setting, we're setting up the foundation now with Jonathan and then we're gonna just continue to build on that as we move forward. And I'll be collaborating with uh, other people like, you know, including Jonathan outside of the Renegade universe within the next year as well. So it's not just this universe. Okay, cool. So on that note, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and hit you with a question we had in the chat from Barta today. He wants to know how one would position oneself to be in a good position for collaboration or be available or something for collaboration. So... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I think the gist of it is what, how, how, what, what, what can a writer do to kind of make themselves attractive to a collaborator, obviously in the professional sense. Jeff, well, how was, how was I attractive to you? <laughs> well, attractive it, helps if, it, helps if, it helps if you have a beard. I mean, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm only 45%. <laughs> writing skill. Boils down to facial hair. Facial hair. <laughs> uh, I guess. I guess to answer that question, um, it, it's really about how good of a writer are you. You know, like if you if you're a fan of the books, right? Like if if someone came to me, right, and they were they were like, I love your books. I've read them all. I'm intimately familiar with the lore. That saves me, you know, time and and energy. Um, and then if you submit a writing sample and you can show that you can write, uh, that's even better. it's like, those two things are, that's really key for me is like, are you willing to, you know, learn the lore and um, can you write? Um, if you're already like a mid-lister, you've already published some books. I mean, that's even better because now I know you can complete a project and get it out there and everything. Um, that's a big issue I've heard about from, uh, people that bring newcomers on is like, it always sounds like a good idea. Like they want to write a book, but they haven't actually done it yet. So you're taking a massive mm. risk of on an investment with them. Right. Um, right. Right. I think as we all know, like it took me five years to write my first book and that's because it's the first book. It's right. always intimidating. It's always overwhelming when you're starting out and you're doing that first book. But if you get someone who's already published, they already know what they're doing. You know, like they've already like writing. I read, I, I learned this thing in, in school. Um, I want to say it was Stephen King, but he was like, once you write your first book, it's like taking a thesis level class um, in writing. Like you learn just as much from writing a book as you do from getting a degree in it. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And that's because of all the steps that you have to do, the, the editing, everything, just yeah. plotting all of it. Um, I totally yeah. say that. Yeah, and I can I can tell you one hundred percent that is true. Yeah. Well, and, and you see so many things. You're like, I that would have been so much easier if I had done it this way instead of you know. And why don't I get my in my in my own way and so and so forth? Yeah. When, when you write your, I, I got some of those five and ten year books out there in the drawer too. That just you just seem like they never they never will quite get done. And and then after you've written a few, it's just so much easier. Yeah, and. Um, I mean, just to double back on your question, just so I make sure that I answer it, um, to give you a, another example of somebody else that does a lot of collaborations, Michael Anderley. Um, he's a he's another. I have I have lunch with him in like three days from now um, on Thursday, and uh, we've talked. To, I talked to him extensively about collaborations before I did this, just so I could kind of get a, 
an idea of what to expect. And, um, you know, he told me that one of the best resources that he's had has been his readership, reaching out to them. And so he did a fan uh, fueled anthology um, called The Fans Write for the Cathedral Universe. And from there was able to like pick out a few, um, you know, full fledged writers. So if you're a fan of like a major series or something like that, um, or, you know, you think that you could fit that universe really well, just reach out first, talk to the writer, uh, submit a writing sample, show any work that you've completed and uh, let them know that you like the lore. And if someone's doing a fan fueled anthology, like I put out submit, I put out requests for submissions for one for mine, uh, get in on that. And that'll, that's proof that you can do it right there. That's a great idea. One of the things that uh, a lot of people don't think about um, when it comes to uh, getting into doing collaborations, especially from the perspective of um, a beginning writer or a a writer coming into, you know, a seven figure author collaboration where you're, you make, let's just say you've made 10 grand or you've, you've made, you know, let's say five grand on your books in a year. It's still a success, right? Um, if you're going to talk to a collaborator who's a six figure or seven figure author, um, obviously they're, they know what they're doing and you're, you're trying to get into their universe, which is great. And I think it's a, it's a great way to work on your writing skills and, and build your, your resume. But the one thing you have to look at, and, and I think I've talked to uh, two uh, writers specifically who have said that um, they jumped into the collaboration um, on the idea of it and not actually on like actually thinking about what it would take to do. And so, their big hang up is that they're they never really decided and scott you mentioned this too um who's the driving force and who is um somebody's got to be in the driver's seat no matter what somebody has to be in the driver's seat if you have two drivers and no one wants to give then your partnership is probably not going to work so that the i mean the, the number one thing to make sure of when you're going into collaboration from in my opinion is you, you have to get along like like you said jonathan and uh, you, you and, and Jeff had a relationship where you became friends and talked about doing things and and you on a personal level you guys knew each other and you were hanging out and doing things before you started doing the collaboration what I think is key like Scott and I have been friends for seven years and we're just now getting into collaboration together and we've done one before that was well received in an anthology and uh we e even in that anthology we had issues together like deciding who was going to be the in the driver's seat and what ideas we were going to use and and go from there so we learned how important that what that concept was I and mean, we probably knew it then but at, having done it it was like this would be so much easier if one of us kind of had like veto authority right on the final story um when you're done with that don't let me forget i got a question oh, go from john evans i want to ask okay um, so John Evans asks, uh, how do you split up the marketing for the books? Does Jeff handle everything? Yeah. So what's cool about writing with Jeff is that we already had established fan bases going in. We both have our newsletters. We both have our Facebook groups and stuff like that. But part of the deal when Jeff and I were talking is Jeff knows exactly what his fans are looking for in a, like a cover, like what they're used to what would work in the universe. And he already had his artists in place. So he handles all of that. And then he's going to be handling the advertising too, because we haven't done a whole lot since we only have one book out. But when the second book drops, we plan on starting that machine running. That reader's expect managing the reader's expectation is is really important, especially if you have uh, at least half of the collaboration that's having some success and knows who their readers are. It's important. Yeah, that's for sure. Why, that's what we joke. Point. Oh, good. I was going to say to your point about the person in the driver's seat, I told Jeff when we were starting off, like, listen, like, I have no ego in this. I just want to learn and be better and better with every single book that I put out. And I told him, like, the most important thing is that your fans are going to like this. So it doesn't matter what I think. It does to an extent. It doesn't matter even what he thinks, right? It matters what the fans think. Like, these are the people who we're writing for. So we yeah. have to make sure that the books that I put out, his fans are going to receive well. 
That's absolutely correct. And Josh and I joke about that writing the thing for Richard that we know he's not going to like because because he'll <laughs> say no. Well, he knows his fans, and he knows that you know some of the things I write, they're not going to dig it, and so he'll just cut it. And that that everybody wins, but he but he does know his fans, and that's that's one of the hardest things to do is even know your fan base. Yeah, you know it's important. Uh, I think this is a good uh, kind of a pause point to talk about our show sponsor this week. Um, the sponsor this week is Winds of War. It's the second book in the Buried Goddess Saga by uh, Jamie, or as we call Steve, uh, Jamie Castle and Retsy Bruno. It's their Buried Goddess Saga. Um, it is on pre-order, but it releases tomorrow. You can also get the audio book if you do the one-click purchase for seven forty-seven, which is a hell of a deal in my opinion because Luke Daniels did the audio book. Uh, so book two for the Winds of War. An ancient evil emerges. The Glass Kingdom is at war. Not even the gods can help now. Full-scale rebellion rages in the south, and Sir Torsten Ungar must lead the Glass Army to face it. But when a new unfamiliar king forces Torsten to march alongside one of his fierce rivals, he must draw on his faith to keep the army from fracturing. Whitney Firestone continues his tutelage of the blood mage Sora, who is desperate to get a better handle on her mysterious powers. The, their journey uh, brings them to the merchant city of Window Port, where they seek passage to Yaolin City aboard a ship. It's smooth sailing until they realize an old nemesis is haunting, hunting them, hell-bent on vengeance, and willing to turn an evil, willing to turn to an evil unlike any they've ever faced before. Uh, uh, grab the epic second installment of the Buried Bur Goddess Saga. Perfect for fans of R.A. Salvatore, Cha-Ching, Brandon Sanderson, and Nicholas Ames. You can also grab it on Audible, narrated by, like I said, Luke Daniels. Uh, go pick it up. I'll put it in the live chat right now. If you haven't uh, pre-ordered already, go and do that now. And uh, it's a great, great book. I've, I've listened to the first one. It, uh, Eyes of uh, Web of Eyes. Really good, and they're actually working on the fourth book now. So, uh, you can get started on it. It's a really good uh, epic fantasy series. Um, so going forward to the craft and uh, actually writing, um, when you look at the the collaboration as a whole, uh, you're looking at the Orion series. When you go into it, you have a series arc from beginning to end plotted out that you guys are, are planning to tell that this specific story or when you are you doing like a, a small increments to see are the fans really going to enjoy this if we do this then we'll continue on like how did you guys jump into the process of it yeah i mean we have like a general <clears throat> like first uh sort of story arc idea of where we want it to go um if it's if it takes off the way that we want it to then we'll, we can always look at um creating more arcs in the future um similarly similarly to what i did with renegade star so like renegade star was like a six book initial arc and then um from there once i completed that i was like okay um you know i there's, there's a readership here how can i um you know where can i go naturally without repeating myself um in a fun way and so i created um the celestial arc which is happening right now and so i'm writing book nine right now and uh, that's what I'd like to do with this one. So for me, um, as far as Orion Colony goes and how it compares to the main series, I want both series to um, be like two major pillars. Every ongoing series in that universe, I want to treat equally, whether it's the main one or a collaboration. And uh, I don't want it to just be considered an afterthought. I want it to be considered like right there with the main one. And so, we were talking about advertising earlier. Um, you know, I invest in, the, I'm going to invest in Orion just like I do Renegade and give it the same level of treatment and exposure um, and hopefully bring in new readers, you know, because it's a different type of story. It's not, it's not a space Western. It's something totally different. Which is interesting uh, when you talk about entry points into a series. And a lot of times you look at, uh, you look at big, big, huge, you know, even huge at, at 10 books, but you know, 15, 20 book series where you're like, holy crap, I, 
I'm, I, I've got a whole long ways to go, or you have no idea where to jump in at. Um, going forward with your collaborators, are you looking at doing, you know, multiple timeline or not timelines, but multiple time segments where, like you say, Jonathan's series is 2000 years before your main series. So you don't really have to worry about overlap or conflicting plot elements. As long as the lore and the, the, the history of the world kind of coincides with each other, you're good. Like uh, Richards and my uh, Terra Nova doesn't have any direct interaction with Scott's Datari series. So it, they don't ever have any conflicts. Are you looking at kind of going forward with that type of a process? Or are you looking at kind of bringing them a little bit closer together where you can link them? Um, yeah, linking with, it is always a possibility. I don't think it's it's uh, necessarily possible with ours unless we do like descendants of people from the Orion colony mm. um, into the main series, which is always something uh, we might explore. But as far as interaction, yeah, I mean, if I can come up with a good premise for another series um, that takes place at the same time as Renegade or Orion Colony, then I would love to look at that. Um, there are there's tons of like prequel material. There's like a lot of lovable or you know well loved characters uh, in the main series that people have been asking for spinoffs for. Um, there's it, it, there's a there's a, a wide universe of possibilities there, and um, you know the period where um, our our book takes place, um, the Orion stories, at that two thousand year mark, there were there were more than just it was more than just one ship that left, you know, and in present day with Jace in the Renegade series, all of those have gone missing. So except for the one that you know they find in the main series, but like. No one knows what happened to Orion. No one knows what happened to the other ones. So if someone came in with a really cool idea for that, another collaborator, and they wanted to explore one of those ships, we could do, we could do that too. Um, yeah, it's all about like fleshing out the galaxy and the universe. And uh, I mean, I don't, I'm, trying, I'm really trying really hard not to give any spoilers away, but like, sure. in, like book, in book seven and eight, uh, and beyond the celestial arc, we encounter celestials, and they're a different kind of entity. Um, and so, if someone wanted to write a story about that and how that came into being, like that would be cool to you know, we could do that too. So, I'm really open to ideas um, with collaborations as long as they make sense and they build on the lore in interesting and unique ways. Like I don't want another series to just copy what I did before. Like I don't want another renegade, you know, like we've already done that, you know? So I think that's an important step in collaborations too, is like not just copying what happened before, but trying to give something totally new and unique in that universe. Um, I know you're coming up on the clock here. So I want to, um, make sure that we, we get uh, some questions answered. Um, you mentioned earlier doing the uh, an anthology, like a, a, a shared universe anthology in, in your universe and, and, and through which you, you may look at, uh, at doing collaborations or, or, you know, a reader, you have, you have all of your readers saying, this is the best short story in your universe ever. You know, like how, how are you going about that? And, and, um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, I just put out a call for writer, you know, aspiring writers. And um, I said, if you are a fan of the Renegade books and you want to, you know, write in that universe, send me a pitch and a writing sample. So I've already gotten several pitches and several writing samples um, from, you know, fans. Uh, we have a few that are already like a few stories that have already been written. Um, but yeah, I mean, as long as it makes sense and it's fun and like, I think the readers will like it, I'll probably say yes. Um, the writing just has to be good. And, uh, from there, once we have a, a nice little anthology, um, all the profits will go to veterans and, uh, you know, because I'm not gonna split royalties 10 ways, it's too much paperwork. So I'm just going to give it all to a charity and uh, price it at a dollar, but it's just something that I thought would be really fun uh, for fans to get involved with, you know, while also contributing to the mythology of the universe. And not like, this isn't like fan fiction, this is like, you're writing canon here. 
you know. Oh, interesting. Yeah, hell yeah. That's pretty awesome. Mm. That does that leads us right into uh, one of our <clears> questions <throat> um, from John again. It says, uh, do you guys use a story bi Bible with collaborators? And then he asks about Scrivener versus Story Shop and what you'd re recommend when establish universe. W would you recommend establishing a universe first before you invite in collaborators? So some of that's already kind of covered, but the first thing about the story Bible and how you handle some of that and the canon might be some useful tips. Yeah, I, I would I would say just just real quick, um, I, I notice that like sometimes people can get ahead of themselves and they put all this like work into building a universe and a, and a massive epic story. Like I've had friends do that before and then they release the very first book and it totally flops. And they put in like hundreds of hours into building this, you know, this universe out, write the book first and see if it works and then like get a few of them out and then worry about the collaborations and like all this expanded universe stuff because you really like your series really has to have legs in order to open it up to other people. Um, just because when there's two names on a book, it's just naturally not going to sell as well as the main thing. Um, there are exceptions like with Jason Ainsbatch and uh, Nick Cole, their series, but for the most part, like that's kind of the rule of thumb. So you just have to, you have to put the groundwork in first and get that main series out. And then as you go, create the mythology and the lore, take notes and all these different things, whatever helps you. Uh, but don't go into it trying to build like a Star Wars level universe because that's not going to work and you're just going to waste your time. <laughs> Do you have anybody? Uh, <clears throat> Take your hand away. You're very <laughs> echoey. Very <laughs> echoey. Listen to Robot Josh. <laughs> Bring it back to real Josh. We're tired of Robot okay. Josh. Hello. Tessa. There you are. Um, sorry about that. So uh, finishing out 29, uh, 2018 and going into 2019, what do you have going on, uh, Jan? Um, well, I mean, you're looking at it. Uh, this is pretty much my main thing for this month is working with Jonathan um and also writing renegade nine and then that's gonna like our book will release on the 19th and then renegade nine will release at the end of january uh and then our third book might come out at the end of january early february somewhere around then um we're also working on getting an audio deal for that series um so we're in talks right now for that and uh yeah i mean from there just i might do another uh prequel of another character but i haven't decided yet and i'm also uh working with jason anspatch on a side project not in any either of our universes um but just a separate you know separate story that we're putting together so that'll be um i think by april that that should be out very very good. Uh, that, was, that wasn't me, by the way. That's his echo. That's not my echo. Uh, we're in echo denial. To come, uh, Jeff, but Jonathan, if you want to hang out, uh, we've got a couple of questions we want to field to you. And uh, Jeff, thanks so much for coming on and, and spending your Monday night with us, man. It's been great having you on the show. Thanks, man. Sorry I have to jet. Um, I uh, I thought we were scheduled for later in the day, so I, I made a couple appointments. But like the time zones confuse me still because I'm – I'll be – yeah. Yeah, I was on Eastern uh, like three weeks ago, you know, and then I just moved here. So it's still, it still takes some getting used to, but I appreciate you guys, uh, you know, working around me. No, oh, yeah, we'll have to have you back on and and and, and uh, do some one-on-one -on -one time with you. Well, watching the live chat, I think that people really did like your comments. So, so yeah, there's a lot of questions we didn't get to. So but we'll have to come back. No, I'm always, I'm always happy to come on and, uh, you know, we'll schedule it out better. Um, and, uh, Jonathan, you know, he's, uh, you know, I trust him completely with the, uh, the questions about Orion colony. So like bombard him with as much as you can until he, <laughs> he has a, he has a, he has a trustworthy look about him. <laughs> it's the beard. It's the beard. It's beard. Yep. Yeah. And the hair farmer thing going there. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for having me on guys. I really appreciate it. It's nice talking to all of you. That's good to meet you. Take, Take care, Jim. Take care. Uh, so we'll move right into the questions uh, for Jonathan, if you've got time. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions that uh, um, was asked was, how do you keep your story ideas? And this was actually for both of you, but um, 
how do you, how do you keep your story ideas um, um, for the series, either paper or digital, or do you prefer a certain method? So this is going to blow your mind. I don't do anything with them. The, the very first book, like uh, Jeff and I were talking about me coming in writing his universe. So the very first book, we did kind of like a Google Doc where I would just put information to make sure everything was right, like with the lore. But now that I kind of have things down, now I just roll. So we have conversations maybe like a couple times a week. And we're like, hey, let's do X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, yep, sounds good to me. So I just keep on writing. Or if I have a question, I'll reach out to him. Like one of his um, the characters is an Eternal. And Eternals basically heal a lot faster than you and I do. So I was wondering if it was like a Wolverine thing or Captain America because I wanted to get the Eternal drunk. But I wasn't sure if like their system would, you right, know, like you know, like process yeah, the alcohol and they wouldn't be able to get drunk. So fast, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was super cool asking him because I made him like in his own universe, he had to pause and think about it. So like when stuff like that or I have questions, I just call him or uh, text him or something like that, and then he's really fast at responding. That was gonna be one of my earlier questions is how often you guys do your phone conferences. So a couple couple times, two, three times a week. Yeah, I would say like twice a week, twice a week for like phone conferences. And then always like, I, w I don't know about every day, maybe like every other day, like a Facebook messenger or a text or something like that. Because the process is rolling so fast now because I can write a book in two weeks. So in two weeks, like we have to get all that information in that I need from him. And then after that, it's editing and then it goes to our editor and then it goes to him to look at. But in the meantime, it's like he's showing me cover art. We're making sure the betas are lined up and stuff like that. So when I'm working on one of the books for the Orion Colony, because what I'm doing right now is I'm writing a book for Orion and then a book of mine and the book Orion, book of mine. So when we're writing for the Orion series, things roll pretty fast. So what's the average word count on one of these books? I was I just going to ask that, Chuck, because you said it's a book every two weeks. So, I mean, you're a full-time writer, but you're also a dad. You do you work out. You're a human being. You were you were doing uh, some some modeling and some and some uh, personal training as well. So, what what's your writing schedule look like a day, man? Yeah, dude. So I've been waking up at five o'clock, and I'm trying to figure out a way to push it up even earlier. So wake up at four a.m. I, I, I thought I was doing good at waking up at five a.m. Then I was talking to Orlando Sanchez. That guy's waking up at three a.m. I'm like, oh man, that's what I do. That's some next level stuff. So. I wake up at 5 a.m. and I can usually crank out a thousand words in about 20 minutes now. If I know what I'm writing, like I already have the story in my head. I know exactly when I sit down, there's going to be like crazy monsters in the mist coming out at these people or something like that. So yeah. I can just grind it out because I can see it in my mind and I just write what I see in my mind. And then uh, to answer Chuck's question, our books are like 60K. Still two weeks. Jesus, man, that's you're a mutant. That's so, crazy. So you do your writing first thing in the morning or, or you split out throughout the day or? Yeah. So what I found works like on a normal day and then, you know, normal, there's always like wrenches that get thrown into the machine. So what's normal, but right. on a perfect day, I wake up at five and I write from five till about seven thirty when my daughter wakes up. So I can get three sprints in that time. So it's two and a half hour window and get three sprints. in. So that's already 3000 words. And then she usually naps from noon to two. So there's another two hour window where I can get that last a thousand or if I need to do like answer emails, do marketing and stuff like that. And then I personal train eight clients a week right now. And then I do some mentoring with other authors. And then like at nights, family time. Gosh. That, you're a machine, man. That is crazy. Dude, I didn't start out like this, though. Like, I remember there was times, like, I was writing, like, oh, how do these people write so fast? But I just started cutting out everything. Like, you guys probably know exactly what's going on in the new Daredevil season, and I wish I had time to watch Daredevil. Like, I don't have time any for anything besides just work and family, because those are the two things that are most important to me. So, like, no TV. There's no um, video games. No video. Dude, I miss video games so much, Scott. I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I miss them so much. So I'm hoping that in this next year, I can dial it back um, a little bit because I've been working seven days a week for the last two years. And I'm at the point now where I think I can dial back to just working six days a week and then still be able to bring in the same income. It's interesting, and we've got a couple more questions that I want to get to, but it's interesting to, for our chosen 
uh, career, if you want to call it that, right? Like all of us are okay with working seven days a week, right? And you said, dial it back. And you say, I'm going to dial it back to six days a week. Or you say, I'm going to wake up at 5 a.m. Or like yeah. me, I get up at four. Scott wakes up at three. Like when you look at that, at writers as a whole, we're freaking crazy, right? But yeah. then you look at indie authors and you're like, you guys are insane because normal people don't think about stuff like that. They don't think, I'm going to make a career out of this. So I'm going to get up at five in the morning and write 3,000 words and then do family things, write again on the nap time, do the personal training. Like, every hour is accounted for in your day and there's not an hour that is wasted and think of how much time the average person sits on the couch and wastes time yeah. Yeah. watching you know just looking at the tv and not gaining anything from it it's like this you, is josh we i remember you're telling me the story where you uh you switched to a mac so you would not game as much right and you know that's a sacrifice my i've that's the only time I've heard somebody say they actually switched their whole computer system to achieve a certain goal. Right. Yeah, I deleted all the games off my computer when I started doing this. Any kind of access to video games, I just completely wiped them off my PC. Chuck, did you have a single tear that came down your cheek as you were deleting all the video games? <laughs> it hurt. I, I, There's quite a few of those games. That I, I had like, I looked at my Steam account and I had like, like 1300 hours on skyrim playing with Jeez. mods and just doing all this it was ridiculous yeah, the so, amount of time that i spent now, that was over like five or six years but right. still and so think about if, if if you were a if you took that in multiplied by the amount of words you could write in an hour even a conservatively speaking that's you know a whole series of novels yeah, and then to Josh's point, there is something wrong with us, guys. Like, I think we all can admit that to ourselves <laughs> oh, yeah. right now. Like, we're I would we're I would argue head. that those outside of our chosen vocation look at us and call us crazy simply because they do not love what they do the way we do. That's and my I, argument. I've been writing my entire life, and this is the first time I've ever tried to get paid for it. I did it just because I love telling stories. Yeah. Oh, well, so, what's more, what's more crazy, working your ass off on something you love, or working your ass off for something that you don't get paid well for and you hate? Because yeah. that's what most people have to do. So yeah, that's a good point. And what I found too, at like certain levels of the game, when you talk to people, they don't. I don't know if they resent me, but they definitely don't understand it. They're like, "Why? Why are you working right. on the holiday? Like, why are you working on Thanksgiving?" And I'm like, "Well, but this I, is have what I, do. Same, I have that same in my workout." I have that same thing with my, my best friend. This guy's been my best friend for 25 years. He absolutely loves landscaping his yard and helping people with, you know, building a little pro. I fucking hate that stuff. But <laughs> he looks at me and says, how can you, how can you do this? I'm like, well, how can you do that? That looks like what's hell's waiting room in my book, buddy. <laughs> right there. I don't want any of that. Yeah. It's just a matter, you know, it comes down to the individual and what you love doing. I mean, really, not, I think that's the long and short of it. Yeah. Well, what I like, Jonathan, is that um, people like you and and uh, you, you can see who is going to be successful and who is not because of who is willing to make those sacrifices. And the, the people that look at you and go, why are you writing on Thanksgiving? Why are you writing on Christmas? Those are the people that aren't going to take it to the next level where you over the next couple of years and even this year are taking that to the next level and you're not stuck in a cubicle working a nine to five where you're pulling in 15 bucks an hour working for somebody that doesn't give a shit about you, right? Like you're doing right for you and your family and um that takes a lot of discipline and, and I admire that in a lot of, a lot of authors. Um, one of the questions that we had earlier, um, was, uh, asking what is something that you're dying to write, but don't have the time to, I'm curious, Jonathan, what that means to you. Yeah. So I have a series of books that I want to do, um, a new series that I'm working on and I want to launch it early January just taking everything that I've learned from writing with Galaxy's Edge guys, taking everything I've learned from writing with Jeff, taking everything that I learned from writing Gateway to the Galaxy and pour it into this new project. And I have it to shelve it for a couple months because I made a commitment to Jeff to finish a couple of our books. 
And then also I have uh, the Archangel Wars. Um, and I told my fans I would write a fifth book in that for them. So I'm having to shelve this new idea. But even with that idea shelved, like it's marinating up here. Like sure. the ideas are coming and oh, I know sure. what's going to happen. So that way when I do hit the keyboard, I'm just going to hit it at a sprint and crank that one out. I always like to think of that as the back burner. And I've always got something simmering yeah. on the back burner. Yeah, yeah. That's the perfect way to say it, Chuck. It's fermenting uh, right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the next question is, is and, and actually, Jonathan, you'll know a lot about this with your, uh, your reading wolves, is uh, somebody asks, how do you interact with your audience and find out what they want and what they're asking for? And I think they're, they're asking about both series of the, the Orion and, and your, uh, and your other series, Jonathan. Yeah. So Jeff's done a really good job at this. He figured it out earlier than I did. And if you go and look at his Facebook group, you can see that his numbers, um, but he has a ton of fans that follow him on his massive Facebook numbers. Yeah. Massive numbers, massive following where I spent most of my time building up my email list. And then just, it was last year. It was last year that I decided to start a Facebook group. So listening to your fans and interacting with them, and they'll tell you exactly what they want. That's why I'm writing a fifth Archangel Wars book right up there with Gateway to the Galaxy. I get requests for the Archangels for another Archangels book. I don't know about every day, but I would say like two or three times a week, either like in the Facebook group or in comments or in emails. So I'm listening to them, and that's why I'm going to write the fifth book in the Archangel Wars series, even though it's been three years since that series ended. Yeah, like that's people crazy. still want more. Yeah, it's awesome. Like, and I think that's what a lot of people don't understand. You guys understand this, but maybe some newer authors don't understand. Like, put in the time, put in the effort, and make the sacrifices now, because this is the gift that's going to keep on giving. This is, I mean, if, as long as you market it, you know, you keep your covers up to date, you're investing money in Facebook ads and Amazon, like these books will keep on selling. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Like you write a book and and yeah, you're going to have a, a really good launch or, you know, a couple of good months, but it's up there for your whole life, right? Yeah. So like you're going to make money on that book for the next 30, 40 years, 60, 50, 60 years. So long tail, baby, long tail. Yeah. And I think what some people don't understand is it's like, um, basically, I'm just going to say we're like movie stars. So you know how movie stars like The Rock, he has a okay. bunch of like... Yeah, like The Rock has a bunch of like, <laughs> movies. but he also has movies that haven't done so well, right? right. So it's almost like for for actors, it's like a numbers game. Sometimes they're going to make a movie that makes a killing, and they're going to bring in royalties from that. And sometimes they're going to film a movie and it's going to flop. And it's the same thing for us. Like we all have books. I'm sure that I know I for sure do. I have books that have not sold as well as Gateway to the Galaxy or Archangel Wars. But so it's, it's just like it's weird when you have one that just suddenly starts to sell for no reason. Yeah, you can't figure out why that 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 book that made you want to quit because it's sitting out there just getting all the hate. <laughs> yeah, people start buying it, and you're like, "What happened? What changed? Nothing." I don't know. I'm still waiting for that to happen. Yeah. <laughs> but what's cool about being <laughs> indie authors is that, like, if we have those books that are just you know bringing in like pennies a day or just page reads or whatever it is. We can switch up the title. We can add more content. We can go see what's wrong. We can do new covers. Like you guys are familiar with the Disney vault, how Disney takes away their, like some of their titles or some of their movies and you can't oh, buy yeah. them and they come out oh, of yeah. the vault. Oh, sure. Yeah, That's basically yeah. what you and I, what they're doing is they're just keeping them back and then they're going to like seven years or how long if they put it in the vault. When they put it out again, they're reaching a new audience, right? Because there's a new level of viewership that has grown up and wants to watch that. And you guys and I can do the same thing with our books, right? So maybe if we have a series that hasn't done so well, it's like almost in the vault. And then when we decide to revamp it, we get maybe new covers, add more content, and there's a brand new readership for us there. Yeah, oh, that's a great. I've never actually heard it explained yeah. that way, and I like that a lot. That's very uh, neat. I like that analogy. That's a good one. Yeah, I've got, actually got a series I want to uh, get new covers for and stuff. So that's... Something to so think one of the, about for sure. One of the questions I had, and and I know we're kind of running over, but that's okay. I think we're having a good conversation. For for you specifically, Jonathan, and, and this kind of goes to to one of the things that I'm looking at this year is uh earlier you said you you're you're working on um your collaboration and then one of your books, and then collaboration and one of your books. Um uh Richard had a had a uh hiccup kind of when he 
he stopped the Ember War. He finished his Ember War series and then went to do Iron Dragoons and the Exiled Fleet. And he was his plan was to kind of go back and forth between the two. And then when Iron Dragoons won the Dragon Award, it kind of <laughs> flushed all that out the window and he had to go and, and focus on one. Um, but but uh, a lot of authors, I find, have an, uh, not really an issue, but kind of um, a continual uh, keeping both series in your head and and knowing what's going on and and keeping them separate at the same time while you're switching do you have a problem you have how do you how do you overcome those issues of this is yeah how this is renegade and this is uh your stuff how do you how do you overcome those issues and and uh yeah i, I think that i answered asked the question correctly yeah yeah i know what you're talking about so i think for me it's full immersion and then also it helps that I write uh, fast. So like when I'm in Orion Colony, like I'm fully immersed. Like if I start thinking of ideas for characters in another book, I'll just shelve that kind of like what Chuck was saying. I'll just mm -hmm. go ahead and put that on the back burner and let it marinate. And um, writing fast again also helps, right? Because I'm only two weeks in any given project and then I'm done with it. So full immersion, anything that's coming up or I feel like it's bleeding over to another series, I'll just mentally shelve and to just be in it. And then when it's time to write the next book, it's the same thing. That's, I suspected that was going to be along those lines that you write so fast, but I think that's one of the advantages of uh, Stephen King even talks about it. If you take too long to write a book, you're going to struggle. The longer it takes to write it, the harder it's going yep. to be. Because you can't keep yep. it in your head for forever, you know? And you yeah, get, for sure. And you see little shiny things and bunnies and coyotes. <laughs> Well, we can. I don't know if we mentioned it when we first had John Jonathan, but um, especially now with with these multiple series and and uh, arcs going on, uh, I assume that you're still a pretty heavy pl uh, plotter when it comes down to to actually going through the series and and setting things down on paper. Dude, I'm gonna make your mind even worse right now. No, don't do yeah, that. He's I already said he doesn't plot anything. I don't plot anything. I don't nothing. It's just all in my head. The journey for me and what's super fun about God, this, I can't handle that right now. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, uh, Jonathan, what's your uh, what's your software of choice, uh, Jonathan? You uh, like Scrivener, like Word? What? Nothing fancy. All yeah, right. but yeah, this is uh, Josh. Going back to your question, it's uh, it's just this is fun for me, man. This is like my video games. These are my TV shows. <laughs> my Dungeons and Dragons time. It's just me. Like if I knew exactly what was going on for me, like it works for other people a plot, but for me it would take the fun out of it, because like I'm right there with these characters and thinking like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening to this people, and this guy has a dark <laughs> secret he's not telling anybody, and then this guy is going to assassinate somebody. I know it's going to happen, and I'm just like, almost like I've almost taken myself out of the book so much where I'm just watching it happen, and that's fun yeah. for me. I always like to describe it as as I I just transcribe what's playing on the big screen in my head you know yeah yeah it's just i just kind of describe the movie i'm watching yeah this that's is like a therapy session for me right now because i just realized yeah. that's probably why i'm able not to watch tv or play video games anymore because like writing now is my is my tv video game time so what do you have coming up uh for you in this next year or we're getting ready to wrap up season three here and start season four at keystroke but uh you have uh orion and then you have your ga uh, gateway to the galaxy series what else are you doing in 2019 well you've got uh, order of the centurion coming out too yeah my goodness all right guys are you ready here we go so we have uh, -oh. uh archer's rest which is a group that my wife and i are in with nick cole jason and spock uh, Richard Fox and Chris Fox mm -hmm. and we're putting together just like a small group of authors getting together in Napa and just hanging out and sharing information and Love so Napa. apart apart from that we Sorry, have didn't mean... <laughs> no worries dude apart from that I have a video game coming out for Gateway to the Galaxy so it's a mobile app game that I've signed up with the company and we're shooting for it was going to be Christmas but that's going to be super tight so I told the video game guys I'm like listen I'd rather just do it right and come out with a, like really good content and a lot of content, even if it means pushing it back a couple months. So now we're looking at more like a January or February release. And then I have a trilogy that I'm dropping with one of my other collaborators. Her name's April Baker, and she's awesome. If everybody hasn't heard about her, um, she has one of her 
books being turned into a movie right now by Sony. So she signed like a major movie deal. So we're writing wow. a sci-fi series there. And then um, Jeff and I are working on a plan right now for audiobooks in a way that I don't know if anybody has ever done audiobooks like this before. So we kind of have that. We've been waiting on it for a long time. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we can share some information about what's going on with audio for Orion Colony. Because Jeff and I definitely both see the value and in investing heavily in audio. And neither one of us has Absolutely. done that yet. So we're ready to kind of take our audio books to the next level with what we're working on now. And then I have Orion Colony coming out, Archangel Wars, and then this next big space opera series that I'm going to launch just everything that I've learned over the last year writing sci-fi, like playing to my strengths and not trying to be um, not trying to write military sci-fi because my heart's not in it. Like there's some guys who write military sci-fi who are awesome at it and they know the ins and outs and they love the lingo and they are great at it. I don't like doing a whole lot of research guys. I just want to write and have fun. So for <laughs> me, military sci-fi, I would have to, I know to do it well and to serve it justice, I would have to really like immerse myself in that. And that's one thing I learned writing or the centurion when Jason and I were talking and I was switching up scenes to write good military sci-fi, like you really have to be invested in it. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play to my strengths so instead of military sci-fi, I'm gonna go space opera with this new series. Yeah, that's what everybody I did. Know. Yeah, for everybody who doesn't know, there's a big difference between military sci-fi yes, and space there is. Opera. But so many people don't get that these days because military sci-fi is so big. Right. Right. Yeah, you can't just call your space opera military sci-fi and and He's vice versa. So. <laughs> right. Well, what's interesting about that is um, there's a huge market for both, right? Like, like there is opera is a huge market done correctly. Done. I mean, you can have military sci-fi elements in space opera, and you can have space opera elements in military sci-fi. But if you're you're searching for that, this is how I'm going to brand, and this is what the genre I want to get into. Yeah things that you have to take into account when writing specifically for those genres. And I, I love that, Jonathan, that, that you know yourself well enough to say, I can't do the, what the genre wants, the readers, what they want out of a military sci-fi book. I can't do that. And so I'm going to do this other thing that I know I can do that. I know the readers of this genre likes, and I, I have a lot of respect for that. That, that says a lot about you as a writer. Thanks, man. Yeah. I mean, I've been writing for almost seven years now. So this is all a culmination of what I've learned over so many years of writing. I think last time I counted, I had 38 books out. So, I mean, I've made every mistake along the way. And it's only at this point now where I can be honest with myself, like what you're saying, Josh, and be like, hey, I know that I'm not good at this. And I, I know I could be good at it, but it would just take a lot of time and a lot of research. And I'd rather just not do that. I'd rather play to my strengths. So with this new series that's coming out, it's called uh, The Forsaken Mercenary. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to do like a Jason Bourne meets Weapon X, but in space. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Nice. I'd read that. Right. So it has kind of like a little bit of military, like there was some sort of experimenting going on with this guy, but you really don't know what it is. And then it's just space opera from there. Sweet. Very Thank cool. You. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, what's going on uh with your your new books and and hopefully i can kind of uh sail through the the rest of jeff jeff's books and i guess i'll even really have to sail through his books to get to your books uh, the orion uh series and you said that the first book is out but the second book is coming out soon well what's when's the launch date for that yeah so we dropped the first book last month and then the second book orion uncharted comes out december 19th and these are how many books do you have in the series that you have planned? So that's kind of a good question. Since I don't outline anything, <laughs> I don't really know. That's kind of like the fun part for me. Again, who knows what's happening? So there's two books that we have written. We're going to do three and four for sure. And then I think we're going to kind of play it by ear. If the fans want it and they're hungry for it, I'm going to keep on writing. So, I mean, Jeff was talking about even making it out to like eight, nine. So it runs like it's just as strong of a storyline as the Renegade, the main Renegade series, making right. it like a pillar he was talking about being able to stand on its own. 
so yeah, if the fans want it, I'll keep on writing. You, you what's interesting, uh, something that we didn't talk about that we normally do talk about is the covers and the, the covers for your, for your books and for, um, uh, Jeff's books are crazy good, like crazy good, like she just absolutely screams space opera for the for the series that you guys are writing. It they're phen phenomenal covers. Thanks, man. Yeah, and that's been cool about writing with Jeff too, because I enjoy good cover art, but I don't know if I'm the best at giving direction to artists to create good cover art. So it's cool having him be able to already have a guy who knows what he's doing, and then to be able to handle all that. Did you have a um, a hand in? Uh, the art direction or did you just kind of go with what uh, what Jeff and the artist thought would, would be good for the series? No, one thing that I've learned the hard way is just let professionals do what professionals do best. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm going to concentrate on my craft and I'm going to like let the professional artist, the professional editor, the professional um, advertising person, which happens to be my wife in this case. I don't even mess with any of that anymore. I just do what I do best because nobody can create content. And that goes for all of us, right? Nobody can create the content, only us. But we can outsource everything else. So maybe that's something else that helps um, Chuck with what you would be saying before, like what does my day-to-day -day look like and how do I write so fast? It's because I don't do anything else besides write. Yeah, see, like, I, I, I mean, do pretty much everything else. There so you I, go. I kind of see where you're coming from. <laughs> yeah, so maybe that's it. Yep. It can bog you down. You get out of the flow. You start having to do newsletters and Facebook ads and yeah. trying to, and then pretty soon you're like, you like, wow, I just lost two days of writing. What happened? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. I'm fortunate enough where my wife comes from having an advertising background um, for the last 12 years. And she's actually leaving her job on the 19th to come to work for our company full time. So that's going to even Congrats. free up more of my Outstanding, time. Outstanding, man. Very that's nice. great. That's so cool, man. Yeah, man. I never realized, like, I never thought that writing, like, I always knew that I would be successful because I wasn't going to stop. I was just going to keep on pounding my head against the wall until it broke. But I never, like, stopped to think about what that would mean in day to day. I never thought about, like, oh, I could make more money than I made at my any other job I've ever had. I could give my wife the opportunity where now she's staying home with our daughter. Yeah. Like, I didn't think about, like, that now that it's happening. I'm like, yeah, man, working seven days a week for the last two years is would, is definitely worth it. Like, this is hard work pays off. That's Absolutely. the way. Hard work pays uh, off. We are coming we're in here first. Yeah. Well, we're actually 17 minutes over, which is good. I like uh, when shows run and, and we have a good conversation. Um, I just want to point out, too, that uh, Lauren Moore and Kaylee Williams are starting to do um, their own show uh with the company which is the writer's journey which is on thursday nights um and they're basically they're going to tackle uh, things that beginning authors coming into the space are are looking at and what challenges they face um, lauren is a a, a pretty uh, established editor um, but she's very new to the writing game and 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 kayleen as well and so they are um, starting their own uh, series on Thursday nights. So we're also going to do some um, Monday afternoon shows here in the coming weeks too. So we're, we're really kind yeah. of expanding Keystroke as a company. Um, and that's really, uh, like we say, the readers, uh, it's really because of the viewers and listeners of the show. So um, everybody that supports the show, everybody that, uh, that watches every week, Thank you guys for coming and hanging out with us. Um, we've got a lot of uh, big things coming next year. Uh, we just had about, um, what do you think, 30, 45 minutes of conversation earlier, Chuck, where we we're kind of ironing out what we're going to do. For yeah, us. brainstorming and stuff, absolutely. Yeah. For, uh, for 2019 and figuring out where we want to go as a company and kind of how we're wanting to, to grow. And I've got a lot of good ideas <laughs> on the table, um, flushing some things out and, and uh, I think it's going to be a really good year for for everybody involved. And and Jonathan, awesome, awesome, uh, hearing how you're uh, from the first show where you were you were publishing your own stuff to now and and growing this year. And and uh, I'll be in Napa. Scott will be in Napa. So it all uh, that'll be a great uh, great week to hang out and and uh, network together. I, I, I'm looking we, forward. We to have that. witnessed the Yana's explosion. 
out there. <laughs> That's right. Well, what, what's cool about knowing all you guys, Chuck, Josh, and Scott, is seeing all our growth together year to year. And it's cool that all of us, there's not like a weak uh, link in the chain, but I see all you guys grinding day in and day out. And then we're all seeing it together. We're all seeing each other's success, like little by little. Maybe day to day we can't see it because we're so deep into it. But if you guys can't see it individually, I want you three to know that I see your success, and I'm proud of you guys. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Very, very. I should grow a goatee in honor of this moment. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, Luke just said that um, Josh needs to shave the beard because he plays with it in front of the mic too much. Uh, He is is kind of a goatee (laughs) finger. I cannot stop. Well, next week, next Monday, I'll be gone. So, um, you'll be all, you have like little it blood, blood spots for you shaved it off and everything. So <laughs> it's going to be on. I can't wait. Uh, that's, Jonathan, that's thanks scary. for coming on the show again, man. It was, uh, it's always good having you on. And, you know, you always talk about wanting to motivate and be uh, inspired to write. And, and anytime we have you on the show or talk to you in person or, or even through Facebook, it's always, kind of one of those things where you're like god I, I just talked to jonathan i really need to go bang out like 800 words 900 words and just just you're, you're very good at that about us uh, putting people in the right place to to do good things thanks man i think it's the personal training background that i have behind me and then also i've been just like binging tony robbins that guy's like a machine so maybe it's some of that coming out too yeah motivational speakers uh, well, coming up on Thursday um, for the second episode of The Writer's Journey, Lauren has uh, Craig Martell coming on the show Thursday night. Um, the question is, should I write? Um, this uh, coming Monday, we're going to have a roundtable, um, and I'll put uh, some links in the uh, the uh, group chat to figure out what we're going to talk about. And then Thursday after that, uh, Lauren and uh, Kayleen will be talking to Chris Kennedy about how uh, to get started. And then our, our first lunch special will be on this September 17th. And uh, Richard and I are going to be talking about uh, our successes and failures on uh, collaboration. So um, we've got a lot of good things happening uh, this final month of season f- three. And um, gosh, it's it's going to be a great it's going to be a great uh, year next year. There's going to be a lot of good things happening. I can't wait to see it. So uh, Jonathan, again, thanks so much for coming on, man. It was a great show. Yeah, guys, anytime. Next time I'll wear my uh, Keystroke Medium shirt. That's right. <laughs> we'll send you a whole bunch of swag. It'll be like hats and gloves and T-shirts. And big oh, speaking of swag, I forgot to say uh, who won the contest on Facebook. I'll, I'll, as soon as we're done here, I'll go and uh, figure out who won for the, uh, the bad uh, genre mashup from last week, and I'll get your gear sent out to you. So uh, until next week, um, You guys have a great uh, couple of days until Thursday when we have another show and come back. We're going to talk about some reading. We're going to talk about some writing and, of course, everything in between right here on Keystroke Medium. Later. Later, guys. Can't find my mouse. There we are.